All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to wrap us up by talking about my experience over the last 10 years bringing a new class of technologies, computational immunology, uh, online and into the cloud. The, the presence of AWS was essential, essential for my company's ability to form to grow with outside, without any venture capital and to be able to uh, propagate the architectures that we've implemented to about 40 different pharmaceutical companies. So this is the, the story of that technology and how we brought it online. The story actually goes back over 20 years ago uh, to when people started realizing that antibodies as monoclonals were very effective alternative therapeutic scaffolds. And just a few weeks ago, multiple uh, Nobel Prizes were awarded in the area of um, oncology, using antibodies to be able to change the way we treat cancer, and then also in engineering and display of antibodies, so technologies that made it possible for us to begin generating these very large populations of monoclonal therapeutics. If you are airdropping into this field without knowing what the hell I'm talking about, so the way to think about biologics, as opposed to small molecules like aspirin and Viagra, is that unlike the small molecules, they're big. Um, these are sophisticated weapons of choice produced by your immune system to protect you. Uh, they're too big for a chemist to be able to produce, so they're made inside of cells. And the attractive thing about them is that our bodies are able to produce a huge number of these molecules compared to what our chemists are able to routinely produce in antibody libraries. Uh, the way it works is that sort of pumping through your veins, you have 100 billion or so B cells, and they end up shuffling up part of the genome to make these unique surfaces on the top of those antibodies, and they go and find things you're interested in. This is a really powerful system for making new drugs, as you saw from the previous talk, right? It's a massive, a small, a large molecule library that's the engine of the entire pharmaceutical industry, and it's pumping through your veins. But the problem is sometimes the system doesn't do what we want it to, right? We, we get autoimmunity, or we don't respond to the cancer as the way we'd expect, or our vaccines inexplicably fail. Or just we want to be able to produce an antibody against a drug target, and it's a pain. And for a long time, it was impossible to do that because the system was so diverse that we didn't really have the tools to successfully interrogate what was going on when things went wrong. So my story starts back in 2008. I was working at Pfizer at the time, and because of an arms race between genome sequencing technologies, we suddenly began having access to the ability of sequencing millions of, of DNA reads. And so instead of pointing those at the 25,000 or so genes in your genome, I started pointing them specifically at the millions or hundreds of millions of unique B cell receptors to be able to understand what's going on, to crack that hood open and to be able to make sense of the antibody repertoire. So this was a pretty cool technology, right? So in, you know, we take, take your blood and we spin it down. And at the same time, we're checking to see whether you have HIV or something. Well, not you particularly, but uh, whether you have HIV or influenza, we could take your B cells, and with a little bit of amplification, we could start asking questions that were invisible to us up until the advent of this technology. How many antibodies are being elicited after you get vaccinated? How does that change depending on how we manipulate the vaccine components? Um, why are antibody libraries failing? How dispersed are they and unique? Um, I'm going to show you a pretty cool example right now. So this is uh, a population of antibodies being produced by someone who's HIV positive, and we're basically overlaying a single linkage, um, tracing of how those B cells are mutating over time to try to keep up with the mutation of the pathogen. And this is the kind of thing which is really readily available to us now with the repertoire sequencing that was previously uh, invisible to us and therefore was denying us understanding of the mechanisms by which these viruses evaded us. So these tools required a lot of deep sequencing and at the time the hardware that we had inside of Pfizer was really ill-suited for it because it was a very burst, bursty style method. You need to be able to do a tremendous amount of thousands of computationally intensive jobs for like two days and then nothing for the next three weeks. So it really was ill-suited for the infrastructure that was available and that's why we started moving to the cloud. Uh, we started harvesting out some of these critical metrics from that data, this bounty that told us sort of how many antibodies are responding in a person or a mouse after immunization, how many epitopes there were on antigens, and this gave rise to a tremendous feeding frenzy for this kind of technology. Basically, every major pharmaceutical company wanted to be able to have access to it. And the problem was the instruments were commoditized, but the analysis was not. And so back in 2012, that's when my partners and I hatched this plan to be able to build a therapeutics company, bootstrap it without venture capital. And the idea was we would create uh, a web-based, Amazon Cloud-driven computational infrastructure that we knew people would pay for uh, to be able to analyze these huge batches of data that was coming offline from uh, all these antibody repertoire sequencing platforms. And then we, rather than just cashing out, we would fold that back in 
uh, the, both the data and the money to build laboratories to build infrastructure technologies using the new information that we had to build better antibody discovery platforms. And then finally, once you have those technologies, you use them to build your own drugs. And that's been the history of distributed bio. So this is sort of the, the infrastructure. I'll say the mastermind here is my co-founder, Chris Smith, who's sitting there in the back trying to hide. Yeah, there he goes. Uh, the idea is pretty straightforward. We need a, you know, we want a virtual private cloud. Uh, we want to be able to log into a base interface to upload data and you know, SSH in and be able to manipulate things at the command line as well. And then we want this elastic cloud that can basically burst out um, the, to be able to accommodate very large amounts of data that's input, which has like thousands of, of computationally heavy jobs and be able to then collapse when we're not using it. So we're only paying for the analysis when we need it. That was essentially the, the infrastructure that we produced and a whole bunch of companies got super excited. We made over a million dollars in the first year and there's basically three of us at the time working out of our you know, coffee shops and bars. Uh, and so we were able to take that money and reinvest it to, grow, to both to understand how to build better antibodies but also to, um, to build laboratories and be able to build some of the, the physical technologies. And part of what was very attractive of the way we did this, and, and I think made our business model possible, was that when we built that infrastructure, the architecture basically could be replicated for each client, which is really important for pharmaceutical partners. And they, they were willing to go to the cloud by degree, but they were very concerned about uh, running calculations that were on the same computer that somebody else was using. And so this allowed us to create an independent uh, virtual private cloud with a replicated process, we were eating our own dog food by creating an infrastructure that we wanted to use internally and then we were replicating that for all of our various clients. And they could all burst to their heart's delight and we were not being limited. So I, I couldn't have built this kind of company without the AWS platform to enable this, this infrastructure. To give you a sense of how useful this kind of technology can be, I'll show you an example of one of our partners and then I'll wrap up by showing you some of the sexy things we're doing internally with the tech. Uh, so Twist, Bioscience, just one IPO. They're one of our partners. We use the Amazon Cloud heavily to build up a GPCR targeted library, and we're, we're mentioned over 30 times in their SEC filings. So this, this technology is really transforming the way synthetic biology enables us to go after hard immunological discovery programs. Internally, uh, we continue to expand our, our client base of the software, but it is also, like I said, a stepping stone. So we now have physical technologies like the Superhuman 2.0 phage display library, a Tumblr affinity maturation technology, and then a vaccine epitope focusing technology. Um, given a limited amount of time, I'll just give you a little teaser of each one. You can come ask me more about these things if you're interested. But to put it very briefly, uh, as soon as we were able to start deep sequencing antibody repertoires, um, and there are these libraries, these phage display libraries, so they're basically a, a tube that contains billions to hundreds of billions of unique antibodies, much like the small molecule library you just heard about, but for antibodies. As soon as we were able to start sequencing them, we realized what all the problems were with those libraries, and we were able to start fixing them. And so this is showing a series of designs I made over a series of a few years from 2009 to 2013, where you could see steady improvements in the affinity and the number of hits that were emerging as we start to grapple with why, why are the old libraries were so screwed up and how we could do synthetic biology tricks to be able to fix and optimize them. If there are some people that are antibody engineer nerds in the room, um, I'm going to show you this example of where we are now with our current technology. So this is probably meaningless if you're not an antibody engineer. If you are, uh, this is going to be eye-watering how many hits. We're getting like 6,500 unique hits against each target, with some of them being more active than existing therapeutics coming directly out of the library with no affinity maturation. So it's super sexy technology, and it's a major advance made possible by huge amounts of data. Another cute thing and sort of where we're going towards the future is we have this way where we start with an antibody, so a drug. We have a way in our laboratory of making about 500 million versions of it in about eight days. Uh, and then we apply really aggressive selection pressure to just go, okay, well, I kind of like the starting drug. If I make 500 million versions, I bet a much better drug's hidden in there somewhere. So I'll then I'll select for huge selection pressure for thermostability and affinity or whatever else I'm going for. And I'll find a small population of, of improved members. So the magic trick here is we didn't sequence both of those populations millions of reads each, and we do uh, a number of techniques from just uh, directly statistical methods to machine learning methods to say, maybe we can imply from the properties of the better molecules that emerge a theoretically optimal molecule that's better than anything that came out of even that pool of 500 million, but is implied from the data. And that technique is, is powerful. So I yeah, recently published a method in Nature describing this kind of method applied to T cell receptors to create members that were more active than any of the ones that we pulled out of specific subjects. And we've got innumerable examples of applying this uh, to antibody engineering. So that's the tech. Uh, we're bigger than the three people now, but we're still small. And I'll say that's one of the final advantages of the AWS platform, and that is that 
you don't need as many people, you can just be more uh, clever and strategic about how you perform your engineering. Uh, Fidel Castro once said that if he was going to take over the island again, he wouldn't use 82 people. He'd do half that and just make sure they had a better plan. So that's, <laughs> I think, uh, part of the advantage there. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and uh, take any questions if you have them. All right, thank you all.